So today our featured speaker is Chris McDonald, and Chris is the Natural Resource Advisor for Southern California uh, with the, the University of California's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And his expertise is in managing plants and wildlands with an emphasis on managing difficult weeds. He conducts research on vegetation management by reducing weed populations as well as restoring native plant populations. He also conducts research and education on the early detection and rapid response of weed species, sensitive species habitat restoration, and management techniques, including chemical and non-chemical control methods. And he also educates the public on using native plants to increase our sustainability and wildlife. Chris has conducted research and outreach activities in the southwestern U.S. for nearly 20 years, working almost exclusively in arid and semi-arid ecosystems. So with that, I'll thank you for joining us today, Chris, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. I'm Chris McDonald. There's my email address. I work in Southern California, so I'm not as familiar with um, the vegetation of the Bay Area. I mean, I visited, but I'm not uh, considering myself an expert in any sort of way. Um, <clears throat> but really what I'm talking about today is um, integrated pest management. And this talk is going to be a wide exploration of the many different ways of integrating integrated pest management. Um, and so this we'll, we'll start with with this picture and we'll see this picture a couple of times throughout the, the um, talk here. This is a typical kind of Southern California hill. Um, and so I say you had a landscape and partly because this um, this hill in particular in Southern California, um, I'd say a hundred years ago was pretty much dominated by shrubs. You can see that there's a few on the um, on the hills and in the mid ground, but for the most part, this um, this entire landscape is dominated by non-native invasive weeds, including annual grasses and those yellow flowering mustards in the foreground. Um, so I say you had a landscape. Um, and so then typically we're as land managers, we're tasked with doing something to try and get rid of the weeds. And so we're working on it. We might be planting potted plants, might be mowing it or um, have volunteer field days. Um, but there, there's generally some sort of work that needs to be done um, to get that to function as some sort of habitat. Um, <clears throat> And then you're often doing more work because something happens, a drought comes along or the site floods or, you know, something is happening to where, you know, the weeds are generally doing a good job and oftentimes trying to outcompete those uh, native plants that we're putting in our restoration sites. Um, and then we may or may not have the ability to keep on it. So we might walk away from the site for a little while and those weeds come back. So here's two pictures of um, two tiny little native plants. Uh, there's a little lupin right here at the end of this arrow surrounded by bromes and uh, erodiums. And then here's a little buckwheat plant that's surrounded by a bunch of bromes. And so, you know, had had I not pointed these out, they're they're basically one little native plant in a sea filled with weeds, which oftentimes is what happens in our projects. Um, and so, what I'm hoping for today is that oftentimes this is what where where things end with our projects, but I'm hoping that it doesn't end here and, and that there, there will be many different ways in this talk that will help you to kind of think about how you can continue with weeding efforts on different types of sites. Um, <coughs> and the reality is that trying to have these landscapes that are where we're restoring habitat, we might pr be protecting threatened or endangered species, we're trying to reduce invasive weed populations in, in some way or another, is very difficult work. The weeds are very competitive and they are often more competitive than most of the native plants that we have on these sites. And so this kind of creates this, this weed cycle. And this is not something that's like been published or anything. It's just, you know, a, a, a way to kind of think about this. You have this landscape that's filled with weeds. You do some work, try and get the weeds to get reduced. 
the weeds come back and over time you're you're left with kind of this cycle where you're still dominated by non-native plants um, and it's really difficult to break this cycle so my one of my goals here is to kind of introduce a wide variety of methods to help you understand how to break this cycle um, <clears throat> and one of the first things is to understand the biology of these weeds and <clears throat> if you're trying to break this cycle then you have to stop the weeds from reproducing the annual weeds just cannot be allowed to reproduce if, um, and that that's by you know seed of course and if you have perennials on the site then there you you can't allow them to produce seed and they cannot produce asexually so if there's any sort of underground storage structures like bul bulbs or tubers or nutlets in the case of uh, yellow and purple nut sedge um, so it's it can be harder to control those perennials but still the goal is to stop them from reproducing and then slowly over time you can start to push the um, push the the push the the scale in your favor and break the cycle. Um, <clears throat> and so now that I've kind of teased you with with um, you know what the problem is, um, the question of how do we break this cycle is um, quite literally the subject of textbooks. And so I have the unfortunate job of trying to condense down entire textbook and entire websites worth of material into about an hour and a half here. So while I'm not going to go deep on a couple of topics, just um, be remind, just remember that many of the things that I'm talking about in itself are 20 minute, 30 minute, hour long conversations where there's entire textbooks that have written about it. Like I think, for example, I have one slide on livestock grazing and livestock grazing in itself is a whole textbook's worth of knowledge to go through and to um, discover and digest. So this is not in any way a, a deep dive into um, any specific IPM technique. Um, <clears throat> So we talk about IPM a lot. Um, I'm tossing out uh, the kind of consens consensus definition of what IPM is. Um, and it, it's a process of managing pests that focuses on the long-term prevention of pests, monitoring for damages, and using a variety of management techniques to reduce or eliminate these pests, in our case, these weeds, when they're causing damage. Um, and I think that there's, um, in this wordy definition, there's five major points to consider. Um, the first is that it's a process, that there, there are certain steps that are happening. And when I think of IPM, I think of it as a circular process. It's, um, it's constantly feeding back into itself. So where you start is where you end, and where you start is where you end again. Um, and again, our focus is on long-term management, um, long-term prevention of pests. So we're, we're not just thinking about short-term pest cycles or shorter-term budget cycles. We're thinking about, you know, how can we manage this over a 5, 10, 20-year time scale? Um, on top of that, we're monitoring for damages. We're actually checking to see what is happening in the environment. Um, and we're comparing that to what our goals are. Um, and so the, the integrated part of IPM is um, this fourth part here, using a variety of management te techniques. So you're trying not to just use one technique over and over and over again. You're using the, the appropriate technique or techniques for what you need to do. And um, you are working when you're causing, when those pests are causing damage. So again, you're not going out there just because you want to, but because the pests, in the case weeds, are threatening some sort of goal that you have. So in the case of this garden here, the weeds are threatening the, the tomato plants. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to grow tomatoes, you can't let the weeds grow in your garden. Um, and so when I think about IPM, I think of IPM in this circular process. This is what IPM looks like in my mind. Um, you have established goals and you have targets. Um, you are identifying those pests that threaten those goals. So today I'll talk a lot about invasive annual grasses, um, but there's many other weeds out there. Um, 
you're assessing those control techniques. And so this is where you're putting all of those techniques on the table, trying to figure out which ones are the possible ones um, that you could use. Are you mowing? Are you grazing? Are you hoeing? Are you spraying? Um, and then you're going to develop and implement your management plan. After you've uh, implemented, you're monitoring, assessing the plan. And then you're going to look at what worked and what um, didn't work, and you're going to adapt your plan, adapt your plan. And that might a step you might then feed back into establishing new goals or realigning your targets. Maybe the percent cover of weeds was too high, and now you need to work instead of having a 20% cover of weeds, maybe you need to uh, have 5% because 20% is still too many weeds producing seeds each year. Um, <clears throat> So for example, if, if you were in Southern California and you wanted to restore coastal sage scrub, and that's your goal, you might then identify your pests as often being um, weeds. Many of those are annual grasses, like in the genus Bromus or mustards, Brassica, Hirschfeldia. Um, and so then you might assess what techniques you could use. You could mulch, you could hula ho, or you could spot spray. Um, and then you develop the plan. So if you were doing this in Southern California, you'd want to mulch in October or so. Um, you'd weed when the seedlings are about one inch tall, so that'd be January. And maybe you'd spot spray any of the weeds before they flower in March. Um, then in this hypothetical scenario, we'd assess it and maybe the mulch wasn't thick enough. So a lot of the mustard grew through it or the grasses grew through it. The weeding wasn't frequent enough. Too many of the weeds went to seed. Um, so then we, re, re, we refine our plan. So maybe in the dense weed patches, instead of mulching, we're going to solarize. Uh, maybe we're going to weed more frequently, and maybe we'll do a broadcast spray to try and help get those coastal sage scrub seedlings to establish in a larger area. So that way we don't have one lonely plant surrounded by a whole bunch of weeds. Um, most of what I'm going to focus on today is control techniques. So even though IPM is this multi-stepped process, I'm really only focusing on one of the six boxes that I have up here in my little um, uh, uh, my my worldview of IPM. <clears throat> And I, I think we all know this, but I wanted to kind of make sure we're all on the same page of why we're controlling weeds. Um, and this in itself is a whole textbook and another, um, another hour long talk on why, why we control weeds. Um, so I'm really boiling this down, but um, oftentimes invasive species are a poor substitute for native habitat. Um, so a really great example is pollinators. Everybody loves to have pollinators around. They're a great um, guild of animals to have, um, but many of them rely on native plants for food. So the caterpillars will eat the leaves, the bees will use the pollen to feed their young and also um, nectar. And many pollinators do not recognize invasive plants as food. They don't taste the same, they don't smell the same, or they don't have the same nutrition. And there's even cases of where plants within the same genus, if one is from Europe and one is from North America, there's cases where the pollinators will not recognize the plant from the same genus from Europe as habitat or food. So in some cases, this can be very species specific. Um, on top of that, um, we're controlling weeds because a lot of wildlife species, and, and I'll use a case here of birds, um, have very specific habitat requirements. And there's a lot of sensitive bird species out there that have specialized diets or have very specific nesting requirements. And often those nesting requirements are met with native plants, and they're not as equally effectively met with alternative plants that are non-native. Um, on top of that, many weeds change the fire regime. They can increase the, the flame size or the flame length. Um, they can cause fires to be hotter or they can increase the area burned. They can also alter the fire regime by making fires more frequent. So maybe fires in a shrubland only occurred once every 20 years, but as those invasive annual grasses are coming in, the fires are, um, are, can occur in you know, five year cycles or less. 
Um, and they also can reduce native species recovery after fire. And I think we've all seen this where when a wildfire goes through, a lot of the weeds can establish relatively quickly and the native plants take a several years to um, regain their foothold. Um, <clears throat> weeds can alter natural processes. And so what I mean by natural processes, I mean like stream flow or water flow. Um, they can use more water so they can have less um, less available soil water. They can also use more, um, more uh, nutrients in the soil. So weeds could deplete nitrogen in the soil or conversely, some weeds can um, alter um, salts in the soil, like think of tamarisk. Um, <clears throat> weeds can also change the soil environment by making it more favorable for weeds to establish. And so what I'm getting at here is allelopathy and that there's um, some weeds that can help to, they create soil conditions where only their species thrives really well in that soil environment and other species don't do as well. Um, on top of that, um, weeds can damage roads, canals, walkways, hiking trails, buildings, um, all sorts of infrastructure. Um, and I think last but um, not least, weeds are in many cases ecosystem transformers. Um, there are many cases throughout California where we have invasive plants that are so incredibly invasive that they convert the ecosystem to something else. So again, getting back to this hill that I keep bringing up here. Um, this was a shrubland and it is now an invasive annual grassland. It has had a complete ecosystem type conversion. And so all of the animals that used to be able to live in a shrubland can no longer live in that shrubland because it's now a grassland. And that's pretty amazing to think about how that has happened in the case of 100 years and over hundreds of thousands, probably millions of acres in California, how we've had these, um, these ecosystems converted to something else. So now I've given you kind of the primer uh, of why we're doing the work that we're doing and, um, and what IPM is. We're, we're gonna get into the meat of the talk here of just the weed control techniques and um, I'm gonna focus on six main areas, but again, these are, there's gonna be lots of different things to cover and go over in this talk. Um, so I call prevention step zero. This is what you're doing before the weeds are getting onto your landscape. And you know, the, the simple question to ask yourself is how do you prevent weeds from deteriorating your landscape? Um, the more weeds that you have on the site and the longer they're in the area, the, the, the less native plants you're going to have. We've had numerous studies that just sh basically show that as weed populations increase, native plant populations decrease. The weeds and the native plants cannot coexist. Um, so given that fact, having zero weed species on your landscape or no weeds, no, no new weed species on your landscape will be beneficial and they are the easiest weeds to treat on your landscape because they never showed up. You don't have to do any work killing them. You are stopping them from showing up. Um, so great ways of doing this are making sure you are working with clean equipment. Um, so clean. if you are working an invasive species patch, are you cleaning out your boots? Are you cleaning out your, um, tire, your tires? Um, this is a great case of puncture vine or goat's head but there's plenty of other species that will um, get into the mud on wheel wells and things like that. And are you working with clean tools? Here's a dirty hoe. If that um, garden hoe is working from, um, is being moved from one site to another, then all those um, weed seeds that are in the mud are then working in being moved onto a new site. So if you are working in a site that has some highly invasive weeds, you're definitely going to need to clean before you leave. Um, Mowers are another um, great in an awful sense vector for weed seeds to be moving around. Um, and same thing with, um, with muddy boots um, are another great way of weed seeds to be moving around. And so making sure those, um, the equipment and um, as well as clothes and boots are being cleaned. Um, so the question to ask yourself, are you working with clean, clean equipment? Um, 
On top of that, uh, we have a lot of beautiful landscapes in California, and there's a lot of people who love to go hiking, mountain biking, driving, um, going to vista points, things like that. So, so at these really critical places where cars are parking or mountain bikers are staging or hikers are starting out on their path, uh, are you preventing weeds from entering the landscape at these sites? It is so much easier to clean up weed, weed infestations at the trailhead than every hundred yards down the trailhead for the next um, quarter mile, mile or two miles. Um, and so a really great way to do this is with boot brushes. Um, I love this one here on the right where you have a signage about invasive plants and underneath the sign you have a boot brush um, and then around it is gravel. So hopefully that the, um, the mud that falls off the boots, the weeds are less likely to germinate in this gravelly soil but still you're concentrating all of those new weed seeds that would be coming into the landscape right in this one area, rather than having those weed seeds disperse down the trailhead, or down the trail, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and again, looking at um, some species are important to know how they're moving. So this is uh, Detrichia stinkwort. Stinkwort is not necessarily a weed. It, it's kind of like a, um, there, there's a, there's a lot of it up in the Bay Area um, and it's moving into Southern California as well. Um, but the point here is that um, Detrichia really does a great job of growing along the edges of disturbed trails or roads. It doesn't do as great of job growing through thick grass litter like you see on the, um, the background on the left in this picture here. Um, so if you're trying to keep those trails clean and it, I mean, basically it looks like this picture, the detrichia is growing on the first half of this road, but not the second half. So if you wanna keep the second half of that road clean, then the detrichia needs to be treated. So again, this is one of those special cases where the weed can have some biological properties because these weeds are these seeds are wind blown and they like these disturbed kind of edge habitats where it will be one of those things that can easily be picked up by hikers or on your trucks as you're driving on these roads and move down the trail. Uh, pets are another great one. A lot of people like to take their dogs for a hike and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem of course is when the dogs are chock full of seeds and those seeds are even uh, are possibly being brought home or they're being brought from one preserve to the other as they're um, hiking around for the day um, so again like how do we clean up the the clean off the seeds on the dogs i don't have a good answer for that but part of ipm is to identify pests that threaten goals and those weed seeds are one of those pests that could threaten our goal of maintaining native habitat that is um, that pro that provides for native wildlife. Um, so, kind of wrapping this all up, you know, I think prevention is that that step zero, that that step you do before you do anything. How are you making sure that these weeds are not entering your landscape? And there's a lot of um, a lot of different tips and techniques you can do: cleaning your equipment, cleaning tools, cleaning boots. Um, not letting weed seeds go, not letting weeds go to seed uh, near high use or sensitive sites, uh, working with your neighbors to make sure that their weed problems are not infesting your sites, using weed free materials, um, lots of different ways. Um, the next step to um, being part of an IPM program is um, looking at different types of barriers to reduce the amount of weeds. So basically, if you are a weed seed and you're this, this red-shirted guy here, you are trying to erect a wall so that way they're literally banging their little seedy heads against the wall and they're not going anywhere. They can't get through that wall. Um, so, uh, you know, I call it an insurmountable barrier. Um, and so the first, the first and easiest way to do this is mulch. You're basically creating an organic layer 
uh, in most cases organic layer, um, to stop the weeds from germinating at the soil surface. So again, those weed seeds are banging their head against the mulch and they're not, um, they're not able to get um, from below on the top of the soil surface through the mulch. If the mulch is thick enough, then it will also stop those weed seed roots from reaching the soil surface from above. So think of a lot of your wind-blown seeds like your um, mare's tail or fleabane, um, the canoisa or erigerons. Um, those seeds will land on top of the mulch and the root will germinate. And as it um, germinates and tries to move down, there won't be enough moisture in the mulch for that root to to survive before it hits the soil surface. So again, we have a picture on the left where we have pretty good mulching practices. Uh, it looks like it's thick enough. And on the, the left here, the mulch looks like it's too thin. This is a straw mulch and you can see all the grasses are just growing through it. Um, so again, you wanna be have nice thick mulch like on the right and not thin mulch on the left. Um, Typically, when we're mulching, we're using uh, wooden chips, um, and they're generally uh, readily available. Um, and while they are large and bulky, they're relatively easy to get. There's also a wide variety of different types of wooden mulches, from uh, gorilla hair to um, bark nuggets to just um, uh, chipped uh, wood chips that are probably less than um, three inches um, that come out of a standard chipper. Um, all of these different types of mulch will work. The trade-off will be how long they last, how much they cost, and um, the different uh, levels of flammability. In general, thicker, chunkier mulch is less flammable than thin mulch, like gorilla hair will, is, has a higher propensity to ignite than does um, large bark chips. Um, used less often in wildlands but sometimes this is a great and it, this is a great project to do around like a visitor center where you have a lot of weeds and you have volunteers who might want to help you out is sheet mulching sometimes people call this lasagna mulching um, but basically you are um, creating this sheet of a degradable product and in this case it's in, in the picture up top here it's newspaper and cardboard and you're stacking compost on top of it and you're poking holes in it to plant some of your native plants. Uh, like I said, this is not very common, but in a in high intense air, a high use, high, highly visible area where you might be able to get a lot of help, this, this could be one of those um, methods. Um, and here's kind of the, the quick and dirty on sheet mulching. Uh, you know, this, this again is like one of those, you know, talk about it for 20 minutes, but I have two minutes to talk about it. Um, but sheet mulching is definitely a process. Um, you need to clear the area. Um, and if you're working in an area where you might have like near a visitor center, um, install irrigation or work around the irrigation, you're definitely investing in whatever material you're using for the sheet mulching, be it cardboard or newspaper or something else. You also want to remove anything from that cardboard that is not biodegradable. So like any sort of plastic or um, tape or anything like that. Um, you're going to lay it out so it's overlapping. You're going to um, dig out the edges so that way you don't have weeds growing between the, the cracks and the barriers between the edge of the cardboard and whatever your sidewalk or other landscaping is. Then you're going to cover it with some sort of uh, mulch or compost or something like that. Water it down so the so that the cardboard starts to get soft. And then you're either going to cut the holes in it and put your plants in there that you want to plant, or you're going to wait till the cardboard degrades. And that can take anywhere from a couple of months to um, longer than a year, depending on how dry it is. Um, so that was the quick and dirty on sheet mulching. Um, Inorganic mulch or rock mulch is less frequently used, but again, it might be used around like a visitor center or something like that. Um, there's a boatload of different rock mulches out there. They're generally, you know, done for aesthetic reasons, but rock mulch, of course, lasts much longer than the, um, the organic bark mulches or wooden mulches. Um, and I should go back and um, oh, I think I have another slide. Okay, never mind. Um, 
So one thing you do want to avoid is uh, mulch madness. Um, this is where you have these, these mulch volcanoes. Um, in this case, it's around some sort of a multi-stem shrub or, or, or tree. And this is something definitely want to avoid because as this mulch pile contacts the, um, the trunk, it's going to start to cause rot on the stem and it could cause the plant to die off. So again, when you're assessing your control techniques, you want to figure out, you know, what are some of these drawbacks to some of these, um, these methods? Um, so avoid the, the mulch volcano or the mulch madness. Um, good practices for mulch. Your mulch should be um, a minimum of two inches, but more often in, in wildlands, four to six inches deep. Um, you're going to have it be less around seeds or seedlings in a planted site, so you don't want to bury those plants underneath mulch. Um, and on top of that, the other mulch madness mistake that a lot of people make is that they mulch entire large areas. Um, and so there are many insects that need to nest in the ground. And the, while the mulch will prevent those weed seeds from um, germinating, it will also prevent many of those ground dwelling insects from getting down into the soil surface as well. And many of those ground dwelling insects are, are oftentimes um, native bees. Um, so there's a trade off that you have to consider here. You could mulch an entire area to make sure that you have the weeds under control. But if you want to enhance pollinator habitat, then you're going to have to let that mulch eventually thin out. So those ground dwelling insects, um, as many of them are pollinators, will have habitat. Um, mulch does not work well on controlling weedy perennials and those that have bulbs or tubers. Um, so this is a great example with um, nut sedges or nut grasses. They will grow right through uh, mulch, even if that mulch is eight inches deep. Um, same thing with like Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass just grows right through um, mulch. And of course, mulch will not control woody perennials. Even if you cut those perennials down to the ground, they will just re-sprout right through the mulch. Um, and in some cases, large seeded weeds can grow through mulch. So occasionally you can get things like goat's head or tumbleweed growing through the mulch, even though they are, um, or because they are relatively large seeded. Um, your mulch will need to be applied every few months to every several years, depending on how wet, cool, and um, humid your conditions are. So up in the Bay Area, this might be happening um, relatively often. Um, on top of that, mulch will, offer, will alter soil nutrients. It has a lot of carbon and has very little nitrogen. So as the mulch is decayed, a lot of that nitrogen will be absorbed out of the soil to help decay some of that carbon. Um, similar in concept to how compost bins work. Um, and um, in cases where you have relatively dry areas, um, some of those drought tolerant plants may develop root problems because they are not adapted to having so much soil moisture through the late spring um, and continuing into the summer. And so some of those plants that need to have dry roots throughout the summer can develop root rot problems. Um, other barriers for controlling weeds, these are ve very infrequently used in wildlands, but they might be used, again, like around a visitor center or something like that. Um, they're often used in gardens or agricultural settings, but there might be some special use cases where you all will be considering using landscape fabrics. Um, one of the problems with landscape fabrics is that they degrade over time and because um, often they're made out of plastic and um, also they can be somewhat unsightly. So as they degrade, they start to come up on the corners or the rock um, mulches will move away from the corners. And so you get these kind of goofy looking um, landscapes because the, the, the barrier isn't being maintained. Um, in some cases, the, um, the landscape fabrics are impermeable or only semi-permeable, so the water will flow off of it and it can cause erosion problems um, in other areas, so down, down the slope. Um, and in other cases, the weeds can grow in between the cracks in the, um, in the barrier. So again, you see here, there's a vine growing between the, um, the step and 
the um, barrier and the rock mulch. Um, and again, so these are things that you have to think about. Um, these are not maintenance free ways of controlling weeds. Um, so tarping, this is not the same as putting down a landscape fabric. A tarp is where you're temporarily trying to control weeds in an area. And so this is where you are using a thick black plastic tarp to control the weeds. So maybe you would have a tree that could re-sprout. And so you're going to put around, well, so when you cut that stump down to ground level, and if it is not a strong root sprouter, but a stump sprouter, you would then put a large tarp around it and that would shade out all of the re-sprouts coming up off of that tree. Or if you had things like nut grasses or nut sedges, you'd um, cover the entire area, put a thick black plastic tarp down, and that will block all of the sunlight um, from those weeds. And they will eventually starve to death because plants feed themselves by harvesting sunlight and making sugars. Um, so if you're putting those tarps out that you, you absolutely have to block the sunlight um, and you have to create a barrier that the weeds cannot grow through. So if you're putting a tarp over a tree stump, you have to make sure that plastic is thick enough to be able to survive being pushed up from the bottom by all those re-sprouts. Um, and it has to stay on the soil for a long time. I said here many months, but in some cases, the tarps need to stay on the ground for a year or longer. Um, in, a, in some special cases, you can cut holes in the tarps and then plant native plants in those holes. And then um, you might have to water them. And then when you are done with the tarp, you can cut the tarp away from the native plant. So that way you don't have this giant black plastic sheet that um, generally looks pretty ugly, but you could also put some mulch over the top of it. Um, uh, one of the problems is that they do eventually degrade. They do get holes, things uh, will step on it, uh, coyotes, whatever, poke holes in it um, with their uh, claws or just dig into it because they smell something underneath it. And so they create a lot of plastic trash and they will also shed water. So if you do have plants, um, native plants growing through it, you're going to have to irrigate it or um, irrigate under it or through the tarps. Um, so solarization is kind of like tarping, but it's not exactly tarping in the case of solarization. And again, this is another whole half hour long um, detailed list of how to solarize and I'm giving it to you in I think like three or four slides. Um, so what you want to do is you want to use a clear UV stabilized plastic sheet and it's really important to make sure that 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 plastic has some sort of UV protection in it otherwise it will just um, it'll start to degrade so that normal um, like painters plastic that you can buy at the big box store that's not the same as um, the plastic that you use for solarization you're using a special type of plastic that can resist being under some sunlight you generally want it to be about one to three mils thick um, thicker will have a little bit less um, heat penetration, but it will be more durable. So there's a trade-off between having one mils, two mils, three mils, or even four mils. Um, if you think that there's going to be a lot of uh, activity out on the area. Um, the soil has to be wet before you put down the tarps, or you have to irrigate under it. Um, so the way that the solarization works is that the, the sunlight goes through the plastic, it heats up the soil surface, and the plastic acts as a little like mini greenhouse that heats up the soil surface up to a hot enough temperature to kill all of the weed seeds and any soil diseases that are in the top, let's call it one inch of the soil surface. Um, this generally needs to be done during the summer. It does not work very well in the winter when it's cool and shady. Um, <clears throat> when you are prepping the solarization area, you need to break up any sort of dirt clods um, you need to mow down the weeds and make sure there's nothing that's pokey that will um, uh, make holes in the plastic. So in short, you really need to have good soil contact with the plastic. And like I mentioned, it, it works in sunny areas only. You can't do this in the shade. I mean, it, it's kind of in the name, solarization. It's not shadeization, right? Um, and so, as I, I mentioned, that you need to have wet soil. This doesn't work. The, the 
the, um, if the soil isn't wet, then there's nothing that the air will not conduct the heat from the soil surface down deeper through the um, soil profile. So you need wet soil. It's kind of like um, uh, an oven mitt. If you use a wet oven mitt and you grab a hot um, cake pan or something from the oven, you will eventually burn yourself because water is an excellent conductor of heat, which is why you always want to use a dry oven mitt. Um, so that water is transferring that heat to the soil depth. And so here's a, a graph, I think this is um, from Maine actually, um, where we're looking at temperature, soil temperatures under the solarization tarp, which is that clear plastic versus the black plastic versus the control soil surface. And you can see that that, that, sol that clear plastic tarp is the way to go because you can get much higher soil temperatures than, the, than just regular tarping. Um, often solarization takes a lot of work. You need to repair a lot of holes. You need to make sure the heat doesn't escape. So you're trying to tuck in all of those barriers. So you can see behind this lady here that the whole edge of this long tarp has been um, kind of tucked in with um, soil from the, the row here. Um, and this was a, one of the cool things I like to point out is that the, um, there was a study of solarization in Maine, and I think of Maine as cool and cloudy and not exactly a place that I'd want to live because I live in Southern California and it's amazing. But if you want to live in Maine, knock yourself out. Um, but the study found that um, solarization worked in the summer in Maine. So if it can work in Maine, it can work in California. Um, and so if you're interested in solarization, my department, UCANR, has a whole website based on solarization. Um, there isn't a, really a guide for um, wildland solarization, so you'll either have to kind of use some of the, the solarization tips and techniques for home gardeners or use it for um, agriculture. But again, the process is, um, is the same between them. You, you need warm, sunny days, wet soil temperatures, let the sun shine, wait several months. Um, and when your soil temperatures are hot enough, generally 130 is good enough to kill most of the weed seeds that are in the top. Then you can remove the um, plastic and you can begin installing your native plants. Um, one modification of solarization is tent solarization. And so if you are in the field and you have large amounts of weed mass and you don't necessarily want to haul them off site, you can solarize them in the wild at a distance from the trailhead or from where you park your truck. And so basically you're, you are putting the weeds inside a wet, humid environment. Then you're building a little tent around it and you are letting those weeds basically cook in that, um, in that tent and they will compost and solarize at the same time and at the end of the day, you'll get this mass of nasty, gooey, weed stuff. Um, and it definitely can be stinky. However, most of the weed seeds will have been um, killed. And so that's great, especially if you're in an uh, infestation that's off the trail and you don't want to be carrying bags of weed seeds around. Um, there are many different ways solarization can go wrong for um, not tucking in your corners. Uh, so in the picture on the left here, there's a lot of heat that's going to be escaping out of there. Black plastic tarp is not solarizing, that's tarping, different techniques. And in the bottom here, while this is probably a research study, these plots are just really small and they're going to get invaded by weeds really quickly. So you do need to solarize at a relatively large scale because those weed seeds from the edges of the tarp are just going to fall into your clean solarized soil um, after a year or two. Um, solarization can generate a lot of plastic garbage. Those tarps have to go somewhere at the end of the season. Um, it does not work well on deep rooted perennials. So again, those nut sedges, nut grasses, anything with bulbs or tubers. Um, on top of that, while I say it works, you know, it generally works for two to three months, that's if you have warm, sunny days. If you have a foggy and cool summer for whatever reason, then, or if you're right near the coast, then it might need to be left out for much, much longer to get those high soil temperatures. Um, 
On top of that, the tarp has to stay out there. And so sometimes that's an aesthetic issue. People don't want to see that there's a big plastic tarp out there. And even though it looks like it's maintenance free, it does take a lot of work to keep it up. Um, so switching gears now. So we've kind of moved from, from covering things to now we're getting into the, um, to, to physically touching those weeds in some sense. So these are all kind of mechanical removal techniques. Um, and this is a huge category of um, management methods. Um, we're going to go, I'm going to go from the simplest techniques to the most complex. Um, and one of the issues with this, of course, is that it is difficult to scale up to the size of a weed infestation, if you have a large weed infestation, without adding additional labor. So oftentimes these are used in small spaces. Um, and on small weed infestations. And if you have a larger weed infestation, then, then we'll talk about that later. Um, so this is probably the oldest method of removing weeds is to literally just pull it by hand. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. It works, on, works great on annuals, doesn't work great on perennials or anything that has a deep root. Um, or anything that will snap at the soil surface and can re-sprout. Um, but definitely be aware that there are many weeds out there that can cause irritation or skin rashes. And also be advised that just because it doesn't cause irritation or a skin rash for you, doesn't mean that it is not, um, doesn't cause uh, allergies or rashes for everyone. Um, there's many weeds that I regularly work with that other people just cannot touch because they'll give them a rash. Um, so if you're unsure, wear protective gloves and um, definitely wear gloves that have protection on both the palm and the back of the hand. So these gloves that are kind of like the, um, the nitrile or latex dipped gloves that are these kind of um, elastic -y cotton gloves, they don't have really good protection on the back of your hand and so if you're if one if the weeds can still poke you on the back of your hand or two if the weeds have any sorts of oils or things like that those oils can penetrate the um, cotton on the back of the glove and can give you a rash on the back of your hand as well and sometimes the back of your hand for some people can be more sensitive than the palm of your hand so you you'll you're more likely to get dermatitis there so definitely wear protective gloves that are fully protective. And I understand these cost more, but the benefit is that you're reducing your risk. Um, so thinking kind of scaling from the, the smallest tools again to largest tools, one of the smallest tools you can use, um, which is great for small areas, but you know we're really not using this in wild areas, uh, weeding forks or dandelion forks. So for those weeds like these um, dandelions where you need to get down into the tap root, tap, root, tap root and pop that tap root up, you press the dandelion fork down into the soil next to the side of the weed, wrench it out and the tap root should snap and pop up and that will help you with some of those deeper rooted dicots. Um, also works well at getting underneath the roots on some of the small grasses. Um, does not work well on anything that has runners, rhizome stolons, or any sort of underground storage structures, bulbs, tubers, nutlets, corms, etc. Also doesn't work well in hard or rocky soils. Um, next, one of the tools that I like to keep in my truck is a soil knife, also called a hori hori knife. There's many different varieties of these, but oftentimes they'll have one side of the blade is relatively sharp and one side of the blade will be serrated. Um, they can be used on weeds that have a taproot um, and also on small to medium sized grasses. So again, you can kind of dig around the plant or you can stab into the soil, wrench the taproot up and pop it. Again, just like the dandelion fork, doesn't work great on weeds with uh, stolons or rhizomes or runners and underground storage structures. Um, there's oftentimes these kind of multi-purpose garden trowels. These are another interesting tool that can be great for those settings where you're, you're in the truck, you step out and you see some sort of large, um, you know, large thistle type of weed that if you cut it off at the soil surface, it's gonna re-sprout. So you can kind of dig a hole around it. You can use the serrated edge to kind of cut it down. 
and you can um, use the front tip of the tool to really get down into the soil and dig those out. Um, so they're great on those small or medium sized weeds that you occasionally find. It's going to take a lot of work to kind of remove an infestation at scale. Um, and again, same caveat, works poorly on weeds with runners or undergrad storage structures. Um, so now we're going to talk about hoes um, and, and tools with blades. First, I'm going to cover the ho-ho hoes. Um, so, ho, so if the first method of weed removal was hand pulling, then the second method of weed removal after um, our ancient ancestors realized that hand pulling weeds was um, ridiculously hard in many cases, they invented the hoe. Um, and the hoe has been independently invented in several of the agriculture, the areas that created new agricultural crops um, thousands of years ago in several different areas of the world. Um, so there are a lot of different hoes. There are a lot of different names for these hoes. And I'm just going to call them by some of the names that I know them by, but you might know it by a different name and that's okay. Um, so here's a quick shot of a bazillion different hoes that are out there. Some are short handled that you'd want to use on your hands and knees. Um, the short-handled hoe has been banned in agricultural settings in California. So if you're working in agriculture, you need to use a long-handled hoe. Um, but we'll cover a couple of these different shapes and what they're used for. Um, on top of that, I want to start with this little tangent and caveat that if you have a hoe in your truck, there's a really good chance that you're probably using the wrong hoe to kill your weeds. Um, most of the time when I see um, a manager's truck, they're using this kind of, this hoe, which is called a swan, swan neck draw hoe. This is the standard hoe that you get at your big box store, has um, almost a, a, a blade that is at 90 degrees to the shaft, and um, it has this kind of neck that kind of looks like a swan's neck, and they're about six inches wide, and it's just a flat blade also called a garden hoe or a field hoe or a draw hoe. Um, the problem with this tool is that it does a great job at moving and digging our soil around, making trenches for planting seeds or severing weeds. But really, the, the way that this hoe works is you swing it into the ground and then pull it towards you. And as you're pulling it towards you, because you have this basic 90 degree bend here, you're taking whatever soil is in front of the hoe and just pulling it up. You're not really severing the weed, you're digging a hoe. You're digging a hole, sorry. Um, so this hoe is really great at digging holes. It is not really great at weeding weeds. Um, so what, what most managers really want to use is something like a grub hoe. And so you can see that the angle of the blade here is at much less than a 90 degree angle compared to the shaft. And so when you hold this hoe at a, a proper working angle, the angle of the blade is much more parallel to the surface of the soil and it will chop the weed in half. Um, and on top of that, these hoes are much, much more durable than a garden hoe. And part of that is because of the way they attach to the shaft. They have this ring or an eye, and that's why they can also be called a ring hoe or an eye hoe. They're also um, somewhat derogatorily called a peasant hoe. Um, but some people call them a field hoe or a grape hoe. Um, and these hoes are really designed to sever the weeds, to chop apart the root from the stem. Um, and so when you get that shallow angle at the soil surface, so you can see that it's coming in at uh, much closer to uh, a small acute angle on the soil surface, rather than chopping in like with this, the swan neck hoe at more of a 90 degree angle. Um, and on top of that, if you pull the hoe shaft down a little bit, you can easily dig holes to um, plant restoration plants. And there's, um, several land managers that um, have kind of seen the light of this hoe and have, um, that I work with, the land managers that I work with, 
and they are using these hoes to dig um, holes for when they pot plants for restor when they plant potted plants for restoration. Uh, it's a really great tool to um, dig in a different type of soils. Um, there are many different types of hoe blades. Um, so here's a wide, I think this is an eight inch wide hoe. Here's a five inch wide field hoe and here's a triangle shaped um, field hoe as well. And again, they're all different size shapes to get at chopping the weed and severing it just below the soil surface. So you're cutting the uh, roots from the stems. Um, and the action of this hoe is you're swinging it to chop. So you're not, so while you are pulling uh, the hoe up towards you, the main action to kill the weeds is the chopping mechanism. Whereas with that swan necked draw hoe, what you're, you have a harder time to chop the weeds and more the action is pulling the soil. This hoe, you're really trying to move as little soil as possible, but still kill the weeds. Um, so again, this hoe has the same drawback as many of the other um, mechanical tools. Doesn't work well in rocky soils, plants with runners, deeply rooted perennials. I keep saying this, but it's just the caveat. Um, another type of hoe that's out there is the scuffle hoe, also called the oscillating hoe. Hula hoe is one of the brand names of this hoe. Occasionally it's called a reciprocating hoe or a stirrup hoe because the shape of it kind of looks like uh, a stirrup that like somebody who rides horses or a cowboy would slip their boots into. And the action for this hoe is that you are pushing it and pulling it and inserting the blade of the hoe, which is down here just below the soil surface or at the soil surface, depending on the weeds, um, to sever the weeds, the roots from the stems. And I've got a couple of pictures of this. So you can see that the blade of the hoe is just under the soil surface. And in this case, the hoe is being pulled towards you. Um, and so you're, you're pulling and pushing this hoe and you're moving back and forth, back and forth, just grazing along or slightly under the soil surface to sever the roots from the stems. This is a great tool for volunteers because they can get a lot of those um, mustards, especially when they're smaller and kind of um, other soft perennials or um, annuals. But if you are swinging this tool, you're using it wrong. It is not a hoe in the sense of like you're swinging it and chopping it. You're pushing and pulling back and forth, back and forth. Um, it's, it's best on small herbaceous weeds. Of course, it doesn't work in rocky soils. Um, it does not work on woody weeds, large perennial grasses, and the same thing with the roots that re-sprout, have runners underground storage structures. I've seen people try and use this on Bermuda grass and the Bermuda grass just grows back. Um, it's a really great hoe to use, light, easy to use, um, but it has to be used properly back and forth, back and forth. Um, and it has to be used properly. Um, you don't wanna use this hoe through the rocks. You're going to dent up the blade, um, but that's, that's true with any sort of tool, right? The tool has to be used properly. Um, there are a wide variety of other types of scuffle hose. There's hose that uh, have a triangle shaped head. Um, there's ones that have a diamond shaped head. So instead of having um, three edges, they have four edges. There's a collinear hoe, which is this one. Um, and then you also have a Dutch hoe, which is called a push hoe. And so instead of pushing and pulling, you are just pushing um, with this Dutch hoe. And the Dutch hoe can be very effective for um, for cutting patches like of sod or weeds that have um, that kind of create a, a solid mat, you're pushing into that mat, lifting it up and popping off that top two inches or so of the soil surface where a lot of those roots are growing. Now, is it going to stop everything from re-sprouting? Probably not, but it, is it going to help your problem get better for another type of treatment method? Absolutely. Um, Last thing you can do is just use a standard shovel and sever the weeds by just slashing into the soil and um, and killing the um, severing the root from the stem. Um, it can. This is one of those methods where you can kill larger weeds, or if you have something like uh, goat's head or tumbleweed, and the goat's head is really really large, 
you can use the shovel stand several feet away and get into, not that this goat's head's that large in this picture, but um, you get the point. You can get in there and get into something that's spiny or prickly and use the shovel to do the work for you. Um, there are a gazillion different types of hose out there. And why are there a gazillion different types of hose? Because there are different soils, there's different weeds, there's different slopes, there's different sized users. So maybe you're a big burly six foot guy, six foot five dude, and you can handle using a really large hoe. But in some cases, you might be working with volunteers who are, you know, older and they might be um, smaller. And so they might need to use a smaller hoe that has, um, has a lot less weight to it. Um, and on top of that, the different shapes also can correspond to um, different longevity and construction of the materials and they can cost um, a lot. So again, like look into using some of these different hoes and find the products that work best for your sites and your preserves. Um, okay, so switching away from the ho ho hoes, we're gonna start talking about tools with blades. Um, Basically, this is any tool that has a sharp edge to it. Um, you've seen many of these tools. You've probably used less of them. And so I'm just kind of cover a, a brief, um, brief review of these. Again, this is another whole 30 minute or so talk on, um, on what these tools are. Um, pruners, loppers are great on um, herbaceous plants and some woody weeds. They, of course, don't work on anything that re-sprouts, um, including perennials or annuals or plants with runners. Um, and these tools are often, you know, used for pruning purposes, and we want to use them for weeding. So you really have to cut the entire plant to be successful, and you don't want to cut into the soil. Um, one tool that is not commonly used, but I thought I'd bring up is a swing blade. So this um, tool has this kind of serrated blade on it. The handle on this is only about three feet long and you're swinging it side to side um, using a lot of shoulder power um, to do it, but it doesn't wear out your shoulders um, that quickly. Um, works great on weeds that are flowering, um, but you have to cut down those weeds that are flowering before the seeds are going to mature. And generally speaking, those weeds are likely to re-sprout, but if you cut them several times, so if you had like a small patch of mustards, they um, start flowering, you swing blade them, then they'll flower again, you swing blade them again, then they flower again, you'll swing blade them again, and eventually they'll exhaust the resources. Um, watch out for rocks and watch out for your partner because you are swinging this, so make sure you stay, you know, 10 feet apart from each other. Um, machetes, this is a super easy tool don't use, or this is a super easy slide, don't use this tool. There are many people who have accidentally cut themselves. The chance of you having tall herbaceous vegetation in California where you need to be using machete is pretty low. I can almost guarantee that almost everybody on this talk does not need to use a machete. There is a safer tool to use than a machete. A slightly safer tool to use than a machete, which is still not exactly a safe tool to use, is a, a brush hook, also called a sling blade or a Kaiser blade. Um, the handle on this is about uh, three and a half feet, and you hold it with two hands and you are swinging that blade, and um, you're using it to cut down thick brush. You likely don't need to use this tool very often. And I think um, it's pretty obvious that you're gonna be using this tool when no one else is around you because if you have an accident, you will end up in trouble. Um, oftentimes for woody weeds, we're using chainsaws. Um, this is probably a better alternative than a brush hook or a machete. Again, still a dangerous tool, but a lot less dangerous than a machete. Um, and that's about all I'll say with that. Um, brush cutters. So brush cutter is basically a modified string trimmer or weed eater where on the, um, the blade, uh, on the end, instead of having those wire or plastic whips, you're having a, a metal blade that's on there. Um, and this tool can be used to cut through tough woody weeds, not like a chainsaw, but if you have woody weeds that are, you know, let's call it less an inch or less in diameter. So some of those, um, 
some of the brooms, um, not old mature brooms, but some of the smaller um, decent size, like the teenage sized brooms, um, it'll work really well on. Um, it does not work well on weeds that re-sprout because you'll cut it all down and then it will regrow. You definitely don't want to use this on rocky areas because you're going to have a lot of sparks. Um, and so you'll definitely need to have water nearby to make sure you don't cause wildfire. Um, string trimmers are another great mechanical tool. These these are the tools that you can use where you can start to get on a larger um, scale sized weed infestation. They're good for something like a tenth of an acre or um, even an acre or two and a small crew can treat several acres. Um, the weeds of course have to be cut before the seeds and again a lot of the same caveats doesn't work on weeds that re-sprout, um, storage structures, um, things like that. You can use it around rocks or rocky soils. It, because the, the wire whips are plastic, you're less, likely to, um, you're less likely to cause sparks, but you still can cause sparks. So definitely have um, water nearby if the vegetation is dry. Um, moving up to larger mechanical bladed tools, um, mowers, I think we're all familiar with mowers, but they're best used on herbaceous vegetation. If you have weeds that re-sprout, you're gonna to need to do multiple mowings. Again, that same caveat with the underground storage structures. Um, and in the case of a mower, you can start to get up to working on a scale of several acres. Again, no rocky areas, and they can be loud and noisy. Um, if you are using mowers or some sort of string trimmer or something like that, make sure that at the end of the day, when you are working on an invasive plant site, that you are cleaning up the mower so you are not spreading the seeds, um, especially some of these small flowered plants, the seeds can get caught up in all of the gunk that gets stuck in the string trimmer or in the mower. And so you need a place to clear that. Ideally, you wanna clear that on site so those weed seeds are falling within the infested area, but you might have to take these back to the garage and clean them in the garage. And then know where you cleaned them in the garage so that way those weed seeds germinate um, in a spot where you'll kill them. Um, again, these are all the caveats. I've pretty much gone over them multiple times. Um, this is what it looks like when you kill a plant that is that can re-sprout. Um, you're just going to get a whole bunch of little things popping up. Um, so moving on to chemical control techniques. Um, how am I doing on time? You're doing great, Chris. I mean, it's 10.45, so if you, you could keep going for another 10, 15 minutes. That's great. We can also okay. end sooner than that and have discussion too. Okay, all right. I think I have about 15 minutes left. Um, okay, that's fine. <clears throat> okay, so oftentimes we have difficult to control weeds or sites where it is difficult to use um, many of the other tools like a rocky site or a steep slope. Um, sometimes chemical options are necessary. There are a lot of different chemicals out there. Um, and I'm going to review just a. Uh, I'm going to review um, a, a relatively few chemicals that are out there. But um, if you're working in San Francisco, I'm really going to focus on the pet, on the chemicals that are on the San Francisco pesticide list. Um, but if you're working outside that area, you might be able to use more than just what I'm talking about today. And no matter what chemical you're using, you always have to read the label and you always have to wear appropriate PPE. And in California, even if it's not on the label, you have to wear long sleeve shirt, long pants, chemical resistant gloves, eye protection, shoes and socks. Um, on, okay, so oftentimes herbicides are the most effective option on hard to control weeds. And many, in many of the examples that I've given beforehand, I've repeatedly said does not work on weeds that re-sprout, does not work on weeds that have underground storage structures, does not work on large woody weeds. These are the options that do work really well on those weeds that we often have in our wildlands. On top of that, herbicides can scale up very efficiently and effectively. If you have a site that has 100,000 weeds spread out over uh, an acre or two, it is oftentimes quite efficient to spot spray that than to be out there hand pulling it or even with, uh, um, even with um, mechanical tools. Um, and on top of that, it 
for those weeds that resprout because um, you can use systemic chemicals, so those that can translocate down to the roots. You can kill the roots, and so those weeds will not resprout, and you're killing those underground storage structures as well, those, those nutlets or rhizomes or bulbs. So again, there, there is a place for, there, chemicals have a place to kill some of these difficult to control weeds. Um, the UC IPM page is a great resource to um, figure out all sorts of weed control options. Um, so I am going to just briefly summarize the list of the herbicides that are on the San Francisco Reduced Risk Pesticide List that was just approved yesterday, I believe. Um, and so there are 15 approved herbicides on the list. There's only four, there's four that are only approved on golf courses, and then there's 11 that are approved on other locations. And so I'm going to quickly just review those golf course ones just in case there's anyone on here who works um, in golf courses. These are the names of the herbicides. I'm going to be using, um, I, I try and use active ingredients, but here's the brand names as well. And the brand names are just for informational purposes. This is non endorsement. Um, so those four golf course approved herbicides are clopyrrolid, quinclorac, penoxylum, and triclopyr. Um, I quickly want to just say that for um, pre-emergent herbicides, these are herbicides that are applied before the weeds emerge, so something like indazoflam or prodiamine. Um, none of these are on the San Francisco reduced risk pesticide list. Um, several herbicides that are on the list do have pre-emergent activity, and I'll get into that, but they're generally not used as a pre-emergent. And part of that is also um, because on the list it will say that the, these herbicides are used for targeted spraying only when dabbing or injection are not feasible. And oftentimes when you're using a pre-emergent, you're broadcast spraying because you want to, you want to make sure all those weed seeds are stopped from emerging. This is often a very effective way of treating a large infestation where the weeds are coming up from seeds each and every year. Um, so most of the herbicides on this list are post-emergent. And what that means is that these are herbicides that are applied to weeds that have already come up. They're emerged, they're established. They often work best on actively growing weeds. Um, and so you don't want to spray them to weeds that have just been mowed um, unless you're doing a cut stump application. Um, and in many cases, they work best on small weeds and on seedlings. If you are integrating treatments, so let's say you're going to you're mowing the weeds and then you're going to spray some of the resprouts, you're going to need to wait one to two weeks or sometimes more for that new regrowth to come up, and then you will spray after you've mowed. Um, so for the post-emergent herbicides, the first group I'm going to talk about are contact herbicides. These are also known as burn down herbicides because they basically work by burning down the green leaves. They don't penetrate wood or bark. Um, if only part of the plant is treated, so if you only treat half the plant, then only half of the plant is going to burn down. The other half of the plant is going to look and function just fine. They generally have no soil activity, and because these are burned down herbicides, they don't, um, they don't have any systemic activity. They don't translocate down to the roots and kill them. Um, so any plant that can re-sprout when sprayed with these contact herbicides will do so. Um, Here's the list. Um, three of the products used in San Francisco are organic. One of them is synthetic. Um, so for these, um, again, they generally will contact, um, because they're contact herbicides, they control small grasses and broad leaves and small perennials, anything that generally can't re-sprout. Uh, Lifeline, which is glufosinate, does have some translocation, so it does have some better efficacy than, some, than the uh, three organic products that I mentioned, but I'm still lumping it in with the contact herbicides because that translocation is relatively weak. Um, again, these contact herbicides will treat only the leaves, not the woody bark, and if the plant can re-sprout, it will re-sprout. Um, I do want to mention um, on a quick tangent here, that the term organic relates to the origin of the chemical and how it is manufactured. So an organic chemical has to come from some sort of natural source, and it cannot have been synthesized by the lab as outlined by the USDA. That being said, organic herbicides can have caution, warning, or danger labels. 
It's the signal word, that caution, warning, or danger, that determines the acute toxicity of the product, and it is not related to the organic certification. So if you are using an organic danger product, because it is a danger product and not because it's organic, it can cause more acute harm than if you're using a synthetic caution labeled product. It's the signal word that determines the harm, not whether it's organic or not. Okay, um, so moving on to the systemic herbicides. So these are the herbicides that um, will, that can penetrate into the leaves, they move around the plant and they can kill the roots um, and also the growing points as well. But generally you wanna kill the roots and that will kill the plant. There are no organic options of systemic herbicides on the San Francisco pesticide list. Um, and there's one-ish on the market depending on, how, there's only one on the market that's organic depending on whether you define this as systemic or not. But that's, that's not something that I wanna get into. I'm not a toxicologist. Um, so the synthetic herbicides on the, um, the San Francisco list are amazapyr, amazamox, triclopyr, aminopyrrolid, and, gly and glyphosate. And I already talked about the four golf course approved ones. Um, a little bit more in depth on the golf course approved herbicide, clopyrrolid, um, Lontrell, which is a, it's a moderately broad spectrum, broad leaf specific systemic herbicide. That's a mouthful. Um, and it does have some soil activity. So after you spray it, it will stop some new broadleaf weeds from germinating for at least up to several months. And on some sensitive species, especially asters and fabaceae, so it's sunflowers and pea families, you can get control up to a year. Um, and so oftentimes it's used in turf because it's a broadleaf specific herbicide. It doesn't have very much activity on grasses. Quinclorac, again, is um, generally a, um, or I shouldn't say again, is a, can be applied pre or post in turf and it controls annual grasses and broad leaves. And it does have soil activity, which can persist up to one year. Um, Panoxylum, kind of like Quinclorac, can be applied pre or post emergent. And again, kind of like Quinclorac, it controls a wide variety of annual um, annuals and broad uh, annuals. Um, that should say grasses, I'm sorry, of grasses and broad leaves. And it also has activity on sedges as well. So if you're in a golf course setting and you need sedge control, this might be one of your options. Um, so moving on to the rest of the non-golf course list, um, we have glyphosate and triclopyr. They are, for most intents and purposes, they are very similar herbicides. They can be used as a foliar spray or a cut stump application. The main difference is that glyphosate is very broad spectrum. It controls grasses, it controls broad leaves, it controls sedges. As a cut stump, it can control trees. It can control nearly all plant types, whereas triclopyr mostly controls broad leaves. It has minimal grass activity. Um, so if you're doing a grassland restoration and a lot of your weeds are broad leaves, but you want to keep the needle grasses around, triclopyr is a great herbicide to be using in that situation. Both of these have minimal soil activity. Both of these are effective on weeds of all sizes. Of course, you want to spray before um, seeds are maturing and flowering. Both of these translocate down to the roots and can kill those underground storage structures. And both of these do have aquatic formulations. Um, Amino pyrrolid is, uh, brand name is Milestone. It can be used on a variety of sites. It is not aquatic. It is very good at treating broadleaf weeds. It does have some activity on annual grasses, and it is very good at difficult to control weeds, especially um, plants in the aster, fabaceae, uh, kinopods, sunflower, uh, goosefoots, um, buckwheats, and nightshades. And it can be tag mixed to increase weed control with triclopyr, which the product for that is capstone. And with aminopyrrolid, um, many perennial grasses are tolerant of it. So again, it's one of those grassland restoration herbicides, um, especially if you have thistles. Um, amazapyr, also known as Polaris, um, is a broad spectrum herbicide, very similar to glyphosate in that it treats a wide variety of plants. It is mostly used in industrial settings and wildland settings. Unlike glyphosate, it has a very long soil residual up to a year. And so that can help to keep seedlings establishing. 
However, that can also, if you have overuse, it can lead to bare ground or not non-target damage with root uptake. This product is also can be used in aquatic sites. Um, Amazomox, which is clear cast, treats a, can be used in aquatic settings or in terrestrial non-crop settings. It has a broad spectrum of controlling grasses and especially broad leaves. It has a relatively short soil activity window. It's often used as a post-emergent only uh, because the pre-emergent window is very small, just a couple of weeks. Um, it's often mostly used in aquatic setting and the label will show that it controls a wide variety of aquatic leads, uh, aquatic weeds. And this one's a little odd, so do check the label because there's a lot of weeds that are not permitted to be sprayed in California with this one. Um, briefly gonna cover livestock grazing and that's basically using cows or sheets or goats. Um, these are also like herbicides, one of the few weed management tools that can scale up to treat very large areas. Um, but livestock grazing is generally much, much less effective than herbicides. Um, it can be great at reducing high densities of weeds, but it's often best at controlling vegetation in general, such as like for fuels reductions. Um, cows and goats and sheep are also excellent at dispersing weed seeds. So if you have a patch of highly invasive plants, you probably want to keep the cows or the livestock out of them because they'll spread those weed seeds around. And then they also disturb the soils, which can then cause those weed infestations to get larger. Um, if all else fails and nothing else is working, you can cut down weeds every one to two weeks for approximately one to two years, and you will get rid of the weeds. This is the last chance method. It does work, um, but you basically have to cut down all of the weeds on your, uh, all of the target weeds on your site every one to two weeks for about two years, and you will exhaust all of those underground storage structures. And this is, this is horrible, but it is a last chance resort. Um, I'm going to skip this tangent on scale because I'm running out of time here. But long story short, um, it's difficult to work on scale. Um, and so oftentimes we're trading methods that work really great at small scales and uh, compared to methods that also work really great on large scales. And so I think this kind of picture here shows you if you're hand pulling weeds, you're working in a relatively small area versus having a, a crew of volunteers pulling weeds. And again, that crew of volunteers can do a great job, but they can't do as good of a job as a mower or somebody who's doing large scale herbicide spraying. Um, and again, these methods also scale from time, from slowest to fastest. Um, I will finish up here with kind of two thoughts. One is that there's trade-offs with using weed management techniques. Um, and one of the biggest trade-offs is that we want to be very toxic to the weeds. We want those weeds to die. We want to have lethal um, control methods, but we also want those weed managements to be completely benign to everything else. And it's really difficult to just be highly toxic to one thing, in our case weeds, and not be highly toxic to something else or to cause some sort of harm. Um, so for example, it's great to be able to use hose and like in this case in the scuffle hoe, um, but it might, um, if you use that scuffle hoe for way too long, you will get back pain. Um, so maybe you can use a weed eater and that will be able to treat the weeds more effectively so you won't have as much back pain but you will be breathing engine exhaust for several hours versus you don't breathe engine exhaust, but then you have herbicides on site. So again, these are some difficult um, trade-offs to deal with. So kind of talking about IPM, the, the integrated part of IPM is combining our methods so that each of them contributes to the outcome. So we're stacking methods. So for example, going back to my hillside here, if we had this hillside that was chock full of annual grasses, maybe to reduce all these grasses, I'm going to graze it for two years and that will reduce the grass population. And then I'm going to mow the areas that I can safely drive to try and control some of those unpalatable species in year three. And then in year three, I'm also gonna seed to natives because hopefully I have enough bare ground to let those natives establish. 
Maybe in year four, I've got some thistles coming in that are really difficult to control. So maybe I'm going to spot spray them and that will help to um, keep their population low. And maybe I'll reseed the natives and maybe having a volunteer planting event to get some shrubs in. And then on year five, maybe I'll mow again because my um, annual uh, wildflowers have started to establish and the grasses I can mow over the top of. Uh, mow over the top of the wildflowers and kill the grasses, or I'll do spot praying or another volunteer pulling event. So this is where all of those techniques that I just talked about for the last hour and a half really come together. This is where you're integrating. So you're taking all of those methods that I've talked about and you're stacking them up to make some sort of prescription. Um, so again, if you're working with a highly invasive weed, Maybe you're gonna add prevention. So you're gonna have boot brushes on the trailheads. Then you're gonna do multiple mechanical treatments. Then you're gonna use string trimmers. Um, maybe you'll mulch over a couple of small persistent infestations and you're gonna keep soil disturbance to a minimum. Uh, we'll skip that. Um, we can skip that. Um, so in summary, the weeds are and can alter the landscapes. They can increase fires and they can reduce habitat for our native species. So using IPM, this process that focuses on long-term prevention, monitoring to meet, make sure we're meeting our goals, using a variety of techniques to reduce or eliminate the weeds when they're causing damage. I've covered about 40 different tips, tools, or techniques here. Plus I covered 65 different hoes in the pictures and I covered 15 different herbicides, and I'm a few minutes over 11 o'clock, but I, I hope that this was, um, was um, good. And so for those of you who are gonna see this online, here's just a summary of the weed control techniques that we covered today. One great source is the Weed Cut tool, or the Weed Cut, IP, uh, weed cut website, which is house housed in my department um, through our IPM, um, our IPM division. And so this has a lot of different techniques in there on how to use. Um, currently, it focuses on non-chemical control methods, but it will eventually incorporate chemical control techniques. Um, and there's my email address. Thank you very much.